Well, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I have no disclosures. So like he mentioned, the objective of my talk today is to talk about the placement methods for percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy, gastrostomy with jejunal extension, and direct percutaneous endoscopic jejunostomy. Um, there are other methods for PEG placement, but the three main ones I'm going to talk about today are the pull, the push, and the introducer method. Um, keep in mind, these are also applicable for the PEG jet and the direct percutaneous um, jejunostomy methods as well. But before I dive into talking about those three different methods, you know, I just want to, just like any other surgical procedure, um, you know, the PEG, it's considered a fairly straightforward, simple procedure, but just like any other surgical procedure, when it's performed by following the same steps every time, you're going to be much more likely to have good outcomes, less likely to have those complications. Um, then also just being familiar with the equipment and the kits that are available in your institution is really important because there is a big market for these. There's a lot of different kits that are um, placed via the different methods. And then also just deciding on where you're going to be performing your procedure in the ICU, the endoscopy suite, or the operating room, and knowing which anesthesia your patient is going to perform best with. And then I can't stress enough the importance of having a great assistant who knows how to perform the procedure. So general principles, like I mentioned, performing the same procedures every time. And I think the three most important procedures or maneuvers are the three safety maneuvers. Those are the one-to-one -one finger indentation, the transillumination, and the safe track. So as you can see on the cartoon here, um, in the middle picture um, is illustrating the one-to-one -one finger indentation. So using one digit indent um, on the abdomen externally, and you should see a focal indentation of the gastric mucosa. At that very same spot, you should be able to transilluminate with the endoscope. You might have to turn down the lights, use the exillumination function on your tower. Um, this is going to be more of an issue in the obese patients. And then the safe track, using that smaller finder needle that comes in the kit um, in a perpendicular fashion, and also have your syringe filled with some fluid so you can see the bubbles. Because as you very slowly inject through the skin and subcutaneous tissues, you're going to be aspirating. And aspirate until you see bubbles. At that point, you need to stop and communicate with the person who is manning the endoscope. Because as soon as you see bubbles, they should see the needle um, in the gastric lumen. If not, you need to find a new spot and perform all three of these safety maneuvers. So. Fourth safety adjunct I find is very helpful with all of these maneuvers is, or all of these methods is the T fasteners. Um, as you can see um, in the bottom here, you have, um, I don't really have a pointer, but you have a small metal clip right here um, that is affixed on the inside, and then outside you have these plastic um, round fixation devices. I like to use three in a triangular co configuration. Um, one thing I do warn you is um, you can't actually, even though you can attach a syringe to these, you can't actually perform the safe track method because there's a hole at the end of the, the needle. So you're always going to be pulling in air. Um, so starting with the pull method, um, just as with any other endoscopic procedure, you're going to first start by inspecting the stomach and the duodenum. I like to already have my snare placed through the working port, um, perform your three safety maneuvers, and then use your introducer needle and catheter. Um, as soon as that's placed into the stomach, I like to snare that immediately. Um, snare it tightly, remove the needle, and then introduce the guide wire. Um, and then loosen the snare just very just a little bit, and then grasp the guide wire. Um, thereafter, you pull your entire um, endoscope, guide wire, and snare complex out of the mouth. So now you have the guide wire entering the patient's abdomen and coming out of the patient's mouth. At this point, loop your tube through the guide wire, and I like to snare just half of the internal bumper with the snare, and then close the snare and pull it into my working channel such that the bumper is um, flush with the endoscope. So now the assistant at the abdomen is going to be pulling that guide wire, and you're going to be forced to follow the peg through the mouth into the esophagus. When um, we get about 30 centimeters into the esophagus, we stop. I let go of that internal bumper with my snare, and 
pull the tube into the stomach, and then, most importantly, follow the tube into the stomach and actually visualize that that internal bumper is in the stomach and make sure that it's not too tight against the gastric mucosa. So when you spin the tube externally, you should be able to spin it without pulling gastric mucosa with it. Uh, make sure that it's tension free at both the gastric and the abdominal wall. Push method, it's essentially identical to the pull until you get to the point of removing the endoscope, snare, and guide wire. At this point, you feed the peg tube over the guide wire and then advance in an anti-grade fashion. Because of the firm dilating tip of this, um, of this gastrostomy tube, you're able to dilate the gastric wall subcutaneous tissues and skin. Also, reinsert your endoscope, make sure you have good placement, it's tension free. Introducer method is a little bit different because here um, the tube and the kit generally is not packaged together. So make sure that the kit, the introducer kit you have is made to fit the tube that you want to place. Um, in addition, these are balloon tubes generally, so make sure that your balloon is functional. Just because I'm probably a little bit more paranoid, um, I feel like these balloon tubes have a little bit greater risk of inadvertent dislodgement, especially in these patients who are hospitalized or in a long-term care facilities. Nurses sometimes inadvertently use those balloon ports for aspiration and um, medication installation. I like to use the T-fasteners. I feel like it's an extra safety measure. Um, so before making my incision, I like to make sure that my gastrostomy tube actually fits the sheath and then also that the balloon is functional. Um, and initial steps are identical to the pull and push methods. Perform your three safety maneuvers, place your introducer needle and then your guide wire. Keeping in mind though that this guide wire, especially for the kit that I use, it's a little bit more stiff and you can inadvertently injure the posterior wall of the stomach. So make sure when you insert that, you do so under direct visualization. Then when you're passing the dilator and sheath, usually this is an all-in-one, make sure that your skin incision is adequate, generally about one and a half times the diameter of your tube, because you're gonna be placing fairly constant and maybe a little bit more pressure than you feel comfortable with, so make sure your skin incision isn't working against you. And then you might also see when you're placing it that the gastric mucosa and the gastric wall actually is tenting down. Um, two things you can do to counteract that is increase your insufflation pressure, and I like to place a larger endoscopic grasper and just give counter tension with the grasper um, along the, the abdominal wall. And then really important is that you place that guy, um, the dilator and sheath fully into the gastric lumen because sometimes what can happen is the stomach can tent down and you don't realize there's actually quite a bit of space between the anterior abdominal wall and the stomach. So make sure it's fully entered into the stomach. You might need to use that counter um, tension like I talked about. And take out your dilator, make sure that your catheter's well lubricated, and then as soon as that's entered into the sheath, just go ahead and blow up your balloon, and then slowly peel away the sheath. Um, and again, pull your balloon up to the gastric wall, make sure it's not too tight, but well approximated. So now I'm moving on to the gastrostomy with the jejunal extension. Um, very similar to what the methods we just spoke about. Um, important here, you have to initially establish gastric access. This can be done two ways. You can do it through an existing gastrostomy tract or you can perform it as an initial procedure. Um, again, you know, I find that general anesthesia is a little bit more tolerable for patients because these um, procedures can be lengthy at times and then also having a good assistant. Equipment, um, front viewing endoscope or a pediatric colonoscope are adequate. Um, these tubes, as I mentioned, they either come as a jejunal extension or an all-in-one peg jet. Um, they generally have a suture affixed to the end of it. If for some reason yours do doesn't, just go get a 2-0 silk and make your own with a nice loose knot. Just be sure you don't go through the feeding channel. Um, I like to use a through-the-scope clip applier and sometimes fluoroscopy and a guide wire as well. But probably more than anything is patience because these can be a little frustrating and um, time consuming um, placing that jejunal extension into the jejunum. So I'm just gonna call this method A and this is through an existing peg. So what you do here is you cut your external peg tubing and then feed your jejunal extension through that internal bumper. So you can see that's already been placed. Um, and then grab this suture loop right here with your through the scope clip. Have your assistant close but not fire. And then I pull the clip, the closed clip back into my working channel and start advancing my endoscope 
um, in, through the pylorus into the dejunum. When I'm at the point where I feel like I am well into the dejunum, I have no looping in my, my stomach, I have my assistant open the clip and I affix it to the dejunal mucosa, but I don't have my assistant fire. And then what I do is I slowly remove the gastroscope back into the stomach over that clip. And sometimes you have to, you know, gently maneuver your scope to make sure that you're not actually pulling back the tube while you do that. And then when I, after I fired, I test the, the tube, uh, make sure it flushes, and then also most importantly that it stays in place. Otherwise you'll be doing it again. Um, a variation to this is um, placing a guide wire and snaring it and advancing it into the jejunum, and then under fluoroscopy, advancing the jejunal extension tube. Um, you can also place a, an all-in-one peg jet through that existing tract. Um, and this, you'll have to actually remove the, the internal bumper. You can do that by just pulling it through the tract, but if you're worried about potentially enlarging that insertion, um, that, that tract, what I do is I cut it externally and then just snare the internal bumper and remove it by mouth. Um, this you can do um, via the methods I just described with the through the scope clip or also advance a guide wire with fluoroscopy and sometimes just using a smaller caliber endoscope like the XP scope, advancing that into the existing tract, um, advancing it into the jejunum and then placing a guide wire and then threading your peg jet over the guide wire under fluoroscopy. And then lastly, like I mentioned, this can be also performed as a primary procedure. In this case, you'll be using the introducer kit, doing those same initial steps, only with the um, passing the extension into the jejunum. So moving on to direct percutaneous jejunostomy. Um, a lot of times these patients, they may have post-surgical anatomy, so knowing your patient's anatomy, um, reading previous operative notes, looking at CT scans, this is especially um, important if the patient has a history of a root and wide ba gastric bypass or a B2, because you want to know, is this um, root limb, is it anticholic, is it antigastric? Obviously those are going to be much more favorable. And then also when you're doing the procedure, assessing your anatomy and knowing which is the efferent limb, because obviously you're going to be placing it in the efferent limb or past the efferent limb. Um, equipment, pediatric colonoscope or the front viewing gastroscope um, are generally fine for this. Some people advocate using a double balloon endoscope. I personally have never used it. And then um, as far as the tube, I just use a smaller PEG tube. 14 to 20 French. And then here, fluoroscopy with contrast can be particularly helpful, especially if I'm not sure which limb I'm in. And again, need a good assistant. So for a patient with normal anatomy, immediately after the ligament of trites is the preferred location. And as far as the um, technical steps, it's identical to the pull peg method that I spoke about initially. Um, the safety maneuvers are extremely important here most specifically in the safe track and the transillumination, keeping in mind with your um, bariatric patients, it could be a little bit more difficult. But you absolutely have to be able to safe track because there's so many other structures that could potentially be in your way. The colon, small bowel, omentum, mesentery, and mesenteric vessels. And then I don't often use T fasteners. Sometimes I do, and if I do, I only use two, one proximal and one distal, but I safe track um, when I place the proximal and the distal. And then um, lastly, probably most important with this, is just making sure you visualize um, the tube placement at the end, because between your mouth and the jejunum, there's a lot of places that that tube can get hung up and trick you. So a Shatsky's ring, the GE junction, an astomosis, or any narrowing or stricture between the mouth and jejunum. And we certainly don't want to be feeding the esophagus or the stomach here. Um, and that is it. Any questions? Mm -hmm.